Production support for the weekly special is provided by... Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet for businesses, hospitals, and homes. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Tonight, join us in Terre Haute as we explore the cultural icons of this fantastic city. We'll travel to the Shrine of St. Theodore Guerin, art spaces of the Wabash Valley, Mr. Blanding's Dream House, Clabber Girl, and so much more. You won't want to miss it. It's all coming up tonight on the weekly special. Hi, I'm Erica Sagone. Thanks so much for joining us. Terre Haute means highland in French, and it's no wonder. The French settlers of the early 19th century had a significant impact on the city's development. In particular, one French nun who went from settler to saint. Nearly 200 years ago, along the banks of the Wabash, Mother Theodore founded a ministry that would change Terre Haute and the world. She grew up in France, always wanted to be a sister. Her mother did not want her to be because of some tragedies in the family. She lost two brothers through fire. Her father was murdered on his way home from the Navy. So she really had to take care of the family. And so finally, when Antrice Guerin was 23, her mom said, you know, I just know you're still interested in becoming a sister, so I'm gonna let you go. Do what you need to do. Do what is your passion. Joining the Sisters of Providence, Mother Theodore pursued a teaching ministry. In 1839, the king honored her as the best teacher in all of France. Shortly after, her superior, Mother Mary, asked Theodore to start a new ministry in a new world, Vincennes, Indiana. She knew that her own health was, was a factor that would jeopardize the whole mission. So Mother Mary said, well, that's okay. If you don't go, we won't go. That's how much faith she had in her. She knew the mission would fail without her. But she did then end up through the vow of obedience saying, well, if it's going to fail because I'm not going, then I, I will reconsider. And who can I take with me? So she took five other sisters, all foundresses. We call them all brave women who came. In July of 1840, Mother Theodore and her companion sisters set out on an arduous three-month journey across land and sea. Arriving at St. Mary of the Woods on October 22nd, where they immediately set to task. When she arrived, there were 250,000 school-age children in Indiana. Of those 250,000, 50,000 of them had a school to go to. Anywhere in Indiana you went. The need was tremendous. So she opened up the college nine months after she arrived here, July 4th, 1841, and it's the oldest Catholic women's liberal arts college in the country. The women faced tremendous adversities, including illness, exposure, and even arson, spurred by local anti-Catholic sentiment. By 1843, they had lost everything, but with support from France, Theodore began to rebuild, determined that the ministry succeed. What got her out of bed every day was the mission. Her love for the sisters, her love for the mission of opening up schools, the love for the children, as well as 
her working with the sick poor. Cholera was very, very prevalent in those times. Lots of kids had lost their parents, so she built an orphanage for girls. And she opened up an orphanage for the boys. She found the way, she found the means. She didn't know the word no. Her avenue of help was from the business leaders of Terre Haute. She would cross over the river, go into town daily, and she dispelled their fears one by one by one through her relationship with them. Faith to her was bigger than any one religion. She would interact with all kinds of faith traditions here. She would interact with all kinds of people here that were anti what she was doing, whether it was opening up the schools or the orphanages. All of them, in the end, helped her succeed. By the time of Mother Theodore's death in 1856, the Sisters of Providence led over a dozen schools, spanning from Evansville to Fort Wayne. For the next 50 years, the Sisters continued to open high schools and colleges across the country in her name. In 1909, after a miracle healing of one of the sisters, Rome opened a case for Mother Theodore's canonization, a case that would remain open for nearly 100 years. We thought, should we stop? Should we start? Should we, should we continue this? We know she's a saint. We know that. Why do we need to continue? It's costing us a lot of money. It's costing us a lot of time. And we had to be convinced and we kept being convinced by the people who were not sisters, who loved her, said, do it for us, do it for the world. The world needs to know she's a saint. And in 2001, she proved it to the community of Terre Haute once again, healing one of the congregation's caretakers. Five years later, Mother Theodore was officially recognized as a saint by Pope Benedict XVI and the sisters began working on the creation of her permanent shrine. We wanted it to be a teaching place. We wanted it to be a place of ministry that people would learn from this. We're celebrating our 175th this year. We want to shout that from the mountaintops. Her spirit and her legacy are still alive and well, not only in the Sisters of Providence, but in all the people that have been touched by all the Sisters of Providence. So it's a journey with a saint, not of a saint. Journey of a Saint is, oh, well, here's her story. Let's learn about this woman of the past. Journey with a Saint is, hmm, I'm going to walk with this woman right now. I'm going to learn about her life so she can touch me, witness her, and be inspired by her and her life. Tap into their own personal resources like she did and live their life to the fullest. That's what a saint is. To learn how you can walk the St. Theodore journey, or to learn more about the Sisters of Providence, visit spsmw.org. I bet if you checked your kitchen cupboard right now, you'd find a package of Clabber Girl baking powder. Did you know that this pantry staple is made right here in downtown Terre Haute? In 1879, Herman Holman produced a formula for the production of baking powder. By the 1920s, Clabber Girl baking powder had become a household name and the top selling baking powder in the country. Today, Holman and Company remains headquartered right here in Terre Haute. Visitors can explore the history at the Clabber Girl Museum, taste Clabber Girl in action at their bake shop, or brush up on your cooking and baking skills at the Clabber Girl Cooking School. Let's head on in. April, thank you so much for having me at the classroom kitchen today. This is a beautiful space. How long has it been around? Oh, the space has been here about eight to nine years, I would say. Okay, and I'm sure there's been a lot of great meals prepared in this kitchen. Tell us about the classes that, that you offer here. Well, we do such a wide variety of classes, and they're really open to all skill levels. So whether you're a novice cook or you're semi-professional, it's really about getting in the kitchen and learning how you know, good food makes great fun. Uh, we have done sushi rolling, Italian, Mexican, um, Indian, vegan, gluten-free. This year we're looking at first Friday night, so the first Friday of the month, and then a Saturday day. Um, but you can schedule for private groups. So if you have a, a group of uh, church friends and you want to come here, we have culinary tour packages. You can come get a tour of the museum, a 30-minute cooking demonstration, of course, with samples to try, yeah. and then have lunch here at, uh, at our place. Why was the kitchen an important mission for Clabber Girl? 
Well, we really wanted to get people back to the basics of cooking. Um, we've become such a society of everything being fast and convenient and takeout, and we wanted people to get back to that, um, which of course goes back to our product uh, with baking powder. But it's getting people in here and learning some skills that will help them be healthier and um, just get them more involved in being in the kitchen and, and learning and eating good food. That's great. Well, while I'm here, I might as well give the Culinary Kitchen a try. April, thank you so much for telling us more about it, and I'm going to head into the kitchen. Great. Have fun. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Brittany. Hi. Well, this looks fun. What are we making today? We're making apple rosemary goat cheese crostini, so little small delicious bites. Some of my favorite flavors in there. Oh, mine too. We have a whole wheat baguette here. So all we're doing here is we're going to be slicing it on a diagonal. And that way, we have more surface area to cover with our yummy apple filling. And we're just going to drizzle our olive oil on here. You're a great drizzler. I try. <laughs> it takes lots of practice. And we have a little bit of salt. We're just going to sprinkle it on. Okay. This is the easy part. So while the bread's toasting, we're going to go ahead and make the goat cheese spread. What do we do? Okay, on the goat cheese spread, we have a food processor here. So what we're going to be doing is adding in about five ounces of goat cheese. So if you want to get that in okay. there. And we have a little bit of heavy cream. Uh, we have four tablespoons. So we can go ahead and pour that in. If you don't have heavy cream, milk is fine. You just are wanting to get it to where the goat cheese is easier to spread. All right, so, so it up. Uh-huh. So then we have our salt. If you want to go ahead and pour that whole thing in there, we have about a teaspoon of salt and then black pepper. Perfect. And then we have a little bit of granulated garlic. If you're not a garlic fan, you don't have to put it in there, but I love everything garlic, Me so too. I always add that in. More the merrier. Uh huh, absolutely. So what we're going to do is put this on here. And then we would turn it on and pulse it for just a couple of seconds. You just want to get it nice and creamy. Now we are ready for sauteing. If you want to grab our saute pan and go ahead and put it over the flame. I'm going to have you put the apples in the pan. Okay. And then if you want to add, we're going to add half of the rosemary that you minced up before. All right. Because we're going to use the rest to garnish it over the top. We're going to do a pinch of kosher salt and a pinch of black pepper in there. What else are we going to add to this? We have golden raisins here. We're going to add it in now so that as they saute, the raisins really plump up and absorb the flavor and the oils Great. together. All right. And all of these raisins go in the pan? They do. Yep. All right. Oh my gosh, this smells amazing. Is that mm -hmm. how you know it's done? Usually you're just looking for when the apples here have gotten a little soft, not quite, you don't want them mushy, but sure. just a little soft. And we're just going to move this just slightly so it's off the heat. And we're going to start assembling, which is my favorite part because this is when we get to make it pretty. And my secret weapon to this dish is we have some honey here. Oh, yes. And we're just going to drizzle some of the honey over the top. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Here we go. And then the finishing touch is we're going to add just a little bit of our chopped rosemary and sprinkle that just right over the top. Well, we're going to go ahead and finish these out, but you can head to the Culinary Kitchen's website, myclabbergirl.com, for a list of current class offerings. To find the recipe for these apple, rosemary, goat cheese, crostini, head to weeklyspecial.org. Well, Brittany, thanks for taking us through this delicious dish in a dream kitchen, and now we're going to go check out Terre Haute's dream house. From the times of ancient cliff dwellers to the times of today, the today of modern cliff dwellers, down through the centuries, man has constantly improved his living condition. Mr. Blandings builds his dream house. Direct from the pages of the best-selling novel comes the laugh and love riot of the year. Spurred by the newly released 1948 movie starring Cary Grant and Myrna Loy, General Electric partnered with Hollywood's RKO Studios to build 76 dream homes across the nation, including one located on Terre Haute's famed Ohio Boulevard. My guess is that it, you know, it was the post-war effort to start building new homes. 
And so this was a way that they could build a little excitement around it. And they're built from east coast to west coast. They're all different designs and different styles, but they all had to include you know, the latest features that were available, the most new modern things. They all had dishwashers and garbage disposals and thermostatically controlled heating and air conditioning. Any special lighting features or plumbing features, anything that was new and available, that's what they were all built with. Terre Haute's dream home also included an intercom system, the Teletalk, and walls made out of reinforced concrete 12 inches thick. There are two other dream homes in Indiana that I know of. There was one in Indianapolis, and then there was another one in South Bend. This was the only home that was built with a steel frame, and the framing for this house was built by a company called Strand Steel in Terre Haute. I think that the developer, which was Newland Johnson Company, I think they decided they wanted to do something that was just different. On October 22nd, 1948, the same weekend as the screening for the movie at Terre Haute's Indiana Theater, the house opened for public inspection. Over the next month, the community paid 25 cents a head to tour the futuristic residence. During that month, 100,000 people came through. For the open house that we held in July of last year, there were about 150 people that came. People got to tour the house top to bottom and see what was thought to be innovative 66 years ago. <laughs> Part of it was also nostalgia. You know, we had several older folks who had been to the original open house. Good memories of that, and, and they were so anxious to come back and, and see it again. One good old friend of ours, he said that he remembers that you and he and his wife, Betty, came to look at this house, you know, came and paid their quarter to get in. He said, you know, we walked through this house and we thought, gosh, we'll never be able to afford a house like this. I think that was the reaction of probably a lot of people, you know, post-World War II. Things had really become prosperous yet, but we're trying to uplift everyone and prove to the world that our great society is still great. You know, I hope that when the time comes and, and the house is 100 years old, that whoever owns it at that point would be happy to do the same thing again and allow people to see what's happened after a century. For more information on how you can tour Mr. Blanding's dream home and to learn about other upcoming Vigo County Historical Society events, visit vchsmuseum.org. One of the things that you'll find throughout Terre Haute are beautiful sculptures like the one behind us, and these are thanks to Art Spaces of the Wabash Valley. It's a nonprofit organization that's peppered Terre Haute with 14 beautiful works of public art. Mary, tell us a little bit more about this organization. We were started in 2005 as a nonprofit organization dedicated to putting up outdoor sculpture to change the landscape of Terre Haute and revitalize the downtown. We do work in other areas. As you can see here, we're not downtown, so we're, we are spreading around Terre Haute and eventually the Wabash Valley. It is Wabash Valley Outdoor Sculpture Collection. So um, we've been working since that time and we've put up 14 pieces. We have four more going up this year, so by the end of our 10th anniversary year, which is this year, we'll have 18 public works. And where can the sculptures be found? Well, they're found throughout the downtown on the campus of Indiana State University. There's one out at Rose Hullman Institute of Technology, and there are several in city parks, including this one in Fairbanks Park. We're getting ready to put one up in Deming Park as well on the east side. Now the piece behind us by Teresa has a really great story. What can you tell us about it? It does, it's called A Song for Indiana and it's to commemorate our state song on the banks of the Wabash Far Away, which the legislature, legislature declared as our state song in 1913. So it's just over a hundred years old as designated as our state song. It preceded even the designation of the state flag. So it was really important. And um, it honors, this sculpture honors the composer, Paul Dresser, who was born in Terre Haute in the house that's right behind us over here. So it's really honoring both the composer and his music, as well as the river, which is right down behind you. You can see it through the sculpture <laughs> kind of see it. when it's high enough, and I think it is today. Um, so it, it's really challenging for an artist to take all of those elements and put them in one piece. But Teresa did a fantastic job, and we're really thrilled with her piece. Now visiting each of these 14 pieces of public art is a really neat way to explore Terre Haute. So Mary, thank you so much for telling us a little bit more about thank art spaces. You. And to learn about the organization's most recent initiatives, visit WabashValleyArtSpaces.com. Mary, earlier you mentioned that Bill Wolf was one of the artists that was part of art spaces, and we actually got to spend a little bit of time with him. Let's take a look. I knew at four years old that I wanted to be an artist. 
my grandmother used to set me right here in, in this rocking chair and made me draw. She would get out Life Magazine, have a stack of Life Magazines here and just keep drawing the pictures. There'd be animals, elephants, and natives and whatnot in, in, in it. And eventually uh, I learned how to draw. My grandparents lived out in the country in Park County and, and there really wasn't many toys or anything to, to play with. Uh, as we got older, uh, my two brothers uh, and I, we played out in the woods. You build forts out there and that's where I learned that you could find clay in the creek and I realized you could just mesh it up and, and make animals and things and, and put them up in the sunlight and the sun would dry them out. That's my initial beginnings is how, how it started to click that I could make things out of clay. I was working at, at the uh, advertising agency and I had someone come and, and ask me if I'd be interested in doing uh, the Korean War monument for Vigo County on the courthouse lawn. I said, uh, yeah, I, I could try. And so that was my first time, and I had no idea what I was doing. I would wad up pieces of newspaper and, and would uh, duct tape it to uh, uh, a PVC pipe skeleton, but I got the figure built up and then put clay over the top of that, and it worked out. Primarily all, all that I've learned, I've self-taught. I believe that almost anybody can teach themselves if, if they want to do it, they can do it. And even today, every one of my pieces that I do, every sculpture, statue that I do, it gets easier and it gets better. So it's just training. By the time I'm 90, I'll be really good. <laughs> Most of my pieces are, are uh, memorial, like veterans memorials. So I've, I've done uh, everything from uh, uh, World War II soldier, Korean War era soldier. I did the Veterans Monument for uh, Salem, Roanoke, Virginia. And that piece uh, has a lot of emotion to it. That, that's the piece that uh, where the soldier's kneeling and has his hand up uh, touching black granite. And in the black granite is an etching of a soldier putting his hand up so they, they meet. Right now I'm working on a piece for uh, Vincennes, which is Francois Vincennes. And there are no paintings. Pretty much uh, it's left up to me to make up what Vincennes looked like. So I, I sort of channeled Vincennes and I sat down one night at uh, two o'clock in the morning and got a whole bunch of clay and sat down and thought, okay, Mr. Vincennes, tell me what you look like. I started on the eyes, and I usually do that on, on all of my sculptures. You know, I, I carve a basic egg-shaped foam head and then start putting clay on it. But the, the, the first thing that I start with is getting the eyes. I, I like to get the whole head pretty well finished and then I can carry on with the rest of the figure because it's almost like the, the way the eyes are and the way the head is shows me what the rest of the figure is going to, how it's going to look. That's the way it works out for me. I just got a, a picture in my mind of what, what his stance would be and I, I pictured him standing alongside the uh, Wabash River overlooking the, the river and looking gallant and, and uh, maybe uh, contemplative. try to do something that's going to have an impact on other people and something that has a lasting impact and, and I totally realize that what I'm doing is going to be here long after I'm gone. It's kind of neat to think, think that after I'm gone, uh, you know, 500 years from now, somebody will, uh, if they take any interest in it, to maybe look at the signature on, on the, the sculpture. Not only will uh, my legacy live on, uh, hopefully it, the, the piece that I'm doing, the sculpture of their legacy lives on too. 
Find out more about Bill Wolf's latest projects or learn how you can see one of his sculptures near you by visiting bill-wolf.com. And to get more ideas about great Terre Haute events or attractions, visit terrehaute.com. And of course, see other Terre Haute stories at weeklyspecial.org. Well, that's all the time that we've got here in Terre Haute. I hope you've enjoyed exploring this wonderful city. Now you've got to get here and see it all for yourself. Goodbye. Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville Communications, serving southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet for businesses, hospitals, and homes. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology. Tap the power. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.